Good morning, Scallywag! Spoo here with another mindless drivel, and if you saw Monday's video, then you already know what's about to happen today. If you didn't see Monday's video, basically we are talking about this new trend that's going through Hollywood, where these giant movies are coming out that are leaving so many plot holes, so many unanswered questions, that the writers and directors of the movie had to come out on social media after the fact to answer those questions. Well, today we are diving deep into one such movie that did just that, and it's a doozy. So buckle up, kids, because we're about to talk about Avengers Endgame. Disclaimer. Yes, I am well aware that I've already talked about Avengers Endgame and uh, the things that I had problems with with that movie on a number of occasions, but today we're specifically talking about the unanswered questions, so deal with it. Now, Avengers Endgame was a truly just epic, epic movie. No one is debating that. And don't get me wrong, despite everything that I have said about Avengers Endgame, I do enjoy the movie. It just had a ton of problems. These questions are some of those. It's not all of them, it's just a good chunk of them. Most of these questions have answers, uh, not all of them, but most of them, so we'll dive into the ones that do and simply pose the ones that don't. So, let's get into it. Now, Avengers Endgame. Truly, truly, I mean, it marked the end of an era. Spanning 11 years and 21 movies, all building up to that moment. Leading up to this juggernaut of a film. Every single movie within the MCU completely intertwined with its characters and its storylines, all building up to this just massive final showdown between Thanos and the MCU's immensely watered-down version of the Infinity Gauntlet. This movie would see the retirement of Captain America, it would see the death of Iron Man, the death of Black Widow, possibly, I mean, we'll have to wait and see when the Black Widow movie comes out, but but at least for the time being. So obviously there was just a hell of a lot riding on this movie from the word go. And as far as the box office is concerned, it delivered. They had to cheat a little bit, but they did manage to grab that coveted title of highest grossing movie of all time. And all of this was just coming off of the heels of Infinity War, which in my opinion was a damn near perfect movie. It's kind of funny actually. I can remember all the way back in 2012 when the first Avengers movie was coming out and everybody was so concerned about how they were going to give everybody an adequate amount of screen time and there was only like six of them. Then by the time you get to Infinity War you're looking at more like 30 characters and they still managed to pull it off somehow. Now that movie had a runtime of two hours and 40 minutes and yet somehow it didn't feel like it at all because every single scene, every single line of dialogue somehow pushed the story forward. Then by the end of that movie, we reduced the cast down to like half. So it should have actually been easier to pull the same feed off with Endgame. They even gave Endgame an extra 20 minutes, a runtime of three hours and two minutes, half the cast, and it failed miserably. Now, I shouldn't say failed miserably because, like I said before, I did enjoy the movie. It is a fun watch, but the movie has got more holes in it than Swiss cheese on the corpse of a Punisher victim. Having said that, I am going to do my best to refrain from rehashing any of the stuff that I I talked about before as far as like my problems and things go with the movie unless it pertains to one of the unanswered questions from the movie itself and uh spoilers obviously for any of the eight people on earth who haven't seen avengers endgame uh plan to and for whatever reason decided to watch this video first so why did this movie fall victim to this new trend of explaining the movie after the fact. Why did Endgame fail where Infinity War succeeded? It would be very, very easy to simply blame it on, uh, you know, too many plot threads to tie up too many character arcs to complete, and just, you know, too many loose ends in general. And all of that is at least partially true. Like I've said before, this movie simply became too big to contain itself. But in reality, this movie focused on too many of the wrong things and spent way too much time delegated to those wrong things. Way too much fan service for one thing. See Monday's video for my thoughts on that. 
They focused on loose ends that simply could have waited. There were characters that were completely unnecessary to the plot, but were shoehorned in because, well, they're in the MCU and this has to include everybody, so why not? And all at what cost? The cost of a good story. So before we really dive in, let's take one last look at Infinity War and how it worked. You got a ton of characters, and somehow every single character gets their fair share of screen time. Everyone gets their moment to shine, all without feeling crowded, all without any of them feeling forced in. There was a strong and clear goal established and achieved without the film feeling rushed, without taking shortcuts. For arguably the first time in MCU history, it actually introduced a villain with clear motivations. In fact, I mean, they were motivations that one could argue are even justified from a certain point of view. And more importantly, he was a villain with depth. He actually showed emotion, even crying over the death of someone who hated him. He had goals, and we understood not only what those goals were, but where they came from and why. So how did Avengers Infinity War work? It worked because although the movie is called Avengers Infinity War, the main character was Thanos. Everybody else you see, Captain America, all of our heroes, they were all the background characters for the Thanos movie. And more importantly, it worked because the movie actually started in the second act. We don't get to see the first act. The first act of this movie took place in previous movies or off screen, leading all the way back to the Avengers in 2012, the first time we see Thanos. He's the one that sent Loki to New York. That was the beginning of his plan. We see more of it in Guardians of the Galaxy. We then even see his ship show up at the end of Thor Ragnarok. So Infinity War literally began at the end of Thor Ragnarok. And by the time we actually see Thanos, he had already gone to Xandar and gotten the Power Stone. So the entire first chapter of this movie is missing completely. So it started in the middle and went from there. Saved a little bit of time. Otherwise, it would have been like a five hour long movie. And for the record, I would have been totally fine with a five hour long cut of Infinity War. But, you know, eventually you're going to you're going to have to get up and go pee or something. So, yeah. But while Infinity War started in the middle, it ended. So the beginning of Endgame is back to square one. We are now at the beginning of a new story and we have to tell it all the way through. Even though we get an extra 20 minutes over Infinity War, we don't get the luxury of starting in the middle to kind of help the pacing of the movie, you know, get going. It basically would be like, let's just cut all of that stuff where they go and hunt Thanos down and the movie just starts with five years later. But they couldn't do that because that opening chapter was too important. We had 10 long years to lead up to Infinity War and only one year to get from there to Endgame. And the only movie in between was Ant-Man and the Wasp and well it was set before the events of Infinity War so that didn't help at all. So we got new conflicts, a new set of goals, we even have a new Thanos and one very giant over convoluted mess of a plot. That's an additional 20 minutes to pull off a bigger, thicker plot with more twists, a plot so thick that it had to be explained on screen no less than three or four times, a meticulous set of rules that were set for time travel and then immediately broken, all culminating in the most expensive and hard to plan shot in all of movie history. That being Tony's funeral scene at the end. Believe it or not, that is the most expensive movie scene ever filmed. All wrapped up in one nice little three hour and two minute long package. It was doomed from the get. Now, if they had, say, made it a trilogy, split Endgame up into two movies, it probably would have worked. And you would have made double the profits. I mean, this is Disney, a, a company that finally got comic book movies right. Kevin Feige is the greatest thing to happen to comic book movies ever, hands down. The fact that he has meticulously planned everything, several movies in advance, shows the amount of care that is put into the planning of these movies. So what happened? We've got the introduction of Captain Marvel who shows up for all of two minutes and then she basically just leaves until the end of the movie, I guess because she's too overpowered for a time heist story. You got Hawkeye.
Hawkeye who loses his whole family, which makes him go all crazy and violent. He becomes Ronan, leaving a trail of corpses all the way across the globe. But just because Black Widow shows up and tells him to come home, he's like, okay, I'm all right now. Let's go. So my first question is, why did Black Widow wait five years to do that? Well, maybe she didn't know where he was. Well, all she had to do was ask War Machine to find out where he's going, and then she knew, and then she's there. So again, I ask, why did she wait five years to do that? Hawkeye. From broken to bro in an instant. Tony Stark argues about the impossibility of time travel. Something that scientists have worked on for just decades, but he goes from arguing about it to actually figuring it out over the course of an afternoon. Now, like I said, not all of the overabundance of questions have answers, but I will give you the ones that uh, the makers of the movie, whether it's the writers, the directors, or the cast, have come out and uh, given us the answer since the movie's release. Um, some of those actually came out here pretty recently, during the quarantine even, when the Russo brothers did a watch party. So, um, yeah. If there's any of them that I've missed, then please let me know because I, I would like to know the answer to all of these questions, especially the ones that I don't have an answer to. So the movie starts with Hawkeye and his family. They're having a nice little picnic. Well, the Barton Farm is actually located in Waverly, Iowa, which is set in Central Standard Time. Like I said, they're having a picnic, so it looks like it's probably around lunchtime. So we can assume it's, we'll, we'll just call it noon. Meanwhile, the battle between the Avengers and Thanos the first time around is happening over in Wakanda, which is in Africa. So how is it daytime in both places? I've actually heard a number of people asking this question and believe it or not, I was actually surprised at the answer. I looked it up myself. This isn't even one that they answered. I just found this one on my own. Oddly enough, Eastern Africa time and Central Standard Time is only about four hours apart. So if it was noon in Iowa, it would only be four or five o'clock over in Wakanda. So there you go. That's, that's why it's daytime in both places. How did Captain Marvel just happen to come across the Benatar out in the middle of space, just in the nick of time to save Tony Stark. This is actually another one with an answer. That being, uh, if you saw Captain Marvel, you know that she shows up at Avengers headquarters at the end looking for Nick Fury. Basically off screen, she shows up, they tell her what happened and that we lost contact with Tony Stark. Last we knew, he was headed towards blah, 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 blah. So she had a general idea of where to look. She went, she looked, she found them, she brought them home. There you go. There is a question that I desperately want answered, and that being, I was never much of a Marvel fan growing up as far as the comic books are concerned, but I loved, 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 loved the Infinity Gauntlet storyline. In the comics, if you're wearing the Infinity Gauntlet, you are basically God. In the movies, not so much. Why is it if you are wearing this thing that turns you into God, A, why does it hurt you and or kill you, and B, why? Why does it only seem to be able to wipe out or bring back the ones that it already wiped out, but it can't bring back the dead that died by other natural things? Or it's very limited in its powers and abilities. Please explain. Someone. Anyone? Please? It just simply makes no sense whatsoever the amount of things that it can't do. Anyway, we fast forward five years. What, what, what happened? What happened in that five years? Any, anything exciting at all? Were there just, you know, nobody out there, no villains out there that were like, hey, the world's kind of suffering right now. This would be a grand time to, you know, make a move. D did that just not happen for five years at all? No? Scott Lang's van was in storage. Who put it there? Why did they put it there? But you, you mean to tell me that whoever put it in storage didn't see this? Well, there's some funky looking equipment in the back here. Maybe I should like hand this over to some kind of authority. No, nah, I'll just put it in storage. It's all good. Then of course, we've got that scene where Black Widow's, you know, like Skyping with everybody. And going back to that whole nobody attacking in five years thing. I mean, Rocket and Nebula say something about a suspect warship that they were investigating. I mean, it turned out to just be like a trash ship, but they, they at least were investigating things, so something had to have happened. Five years is a long time for, for something to happen, surely? And then, of course, you know, Captain doesn't want white dudes reviewing her movie has to take off, and she says, you know, you know, get, you know, later, peace out, I'll, I'll be back when my powers make sense. War Machine's tracking down Hawkeye, or Ronin, or whatever. Speaking of Hawkeye slash Ronin slash whatever, does it bother anybody else? 
that they just call him Clint or call him Barton. I mean, no one refers to him as Hawkeye, like ever. I mean, I remember they did in the Hulk and he calls his daughter Hawkeye, but I think that's it. Why? And then Okoye says that uh, they are experiencing earthquakes under the oceans near Wakanda. Given that there is a somewhat recent story in the comics that kind of uh, set these two against each other, people are actually thinking that that is an easter egg for Namor the Submariner coming soon to the MCU. Possibly even setting him up as like the villain for Black Panther 2. According to the Russos, the earthquakes were just earthquakes, which is neither a confirmation or a denial. But seeing as how there's almost never anything that happens just nonchalantly in these movies, um, I would I would say probably, I guess. I don't know. It's like Aquaman and, and Spock had a baby with wings on his ankles. I, I don't know. He's a weird character. And then, of course, Scott shows up. He explains the whole quantum realm time travel idea thing. They go visit Tony. And Tony and Pepper, of course, got married. They've got a kid now. Tony has retired from being Iron Man for the last five years. He's given it up. And and Pepper has always absolutely hated Tony being Iron Man. She actually even referred to it as her greatest failure. That being said, why would Tony ever consider building Pepper her own Iron Man suit, especially as an anniversary present. An Iron Man suit for someone who never even wanted Tony to be Iron Man, let alone did she ever want to be Iron Man? The answer to this question is so the movie can happen. So they go to the next best thing after Tony says no, and of course we're introduced to Professor Hulk. And when we meet him, he's already Professor Hulk. It's the most non-exciting reveal of a character maybe ever and they're they're just sitting in a diner there, there he is. He says he spent 18 months in the Gamma Lab and combined the best of both worlds, the brain and the brawn. That's, that's great. W what does that mean? How? How, how did you, how, how did you make, how did you do this? The sad thing is there were actually two other, at least two other uh, deleted ideas for the introduction of Professor Hulk. One of them they showed in the re-release of Endgame. They showed some uh, some unfinished special effects where he just kind of shows up and saves some people in a burning building. It was a nice little diehard kind of throwback Easter egg thing. I mean, they even had Reginald Vell Johnson show up uh, as a fireman, so that... That was nice. That was cool. Still didn't explain how he became Professor Hulk. He just kind of shows up. The other one, the one they should have gone with, was actually back in Infinity War. Of course, after Hulk gets the crap beat out of him by Thanos, he doesn't want to come out the rest of the movie. Now, I thought that Hulk was basically scared of Thanos because he's not used to getting his butt kicked. And if you watch the movie with that kind of thought in mind where Hulk is scared, it works. It makes sense. I always assumed that that's why he didn't come back out for the rest of the movie. But apparently, according to the Russos, Hulk was tired of only getting to come out when he was needed. Because, yeah, that, that totally reads on camera. But then at the end of the movie when Banner is in the Hulkbuster armor and he's fighting Call Obsidian, there originally was going to be this scene where, you know, he's trying to get Hulk to come out and Hulk's saying no and Hulk's like, you know, I'm, I, you know, tired of only being used and rah, 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 And so Banner basically just says, you know, well, how about we do this together? And then Hulk bursts out of the Hulkbuster armor and it's Professor Hulk. So why, why didn't we get that? That sounds exciting. That sounds visual really interesting. So why did we just get, here he is, in a, he's in a diner, he's eating some eggs, take, taking some selfies with kids. Professor Hulk, everyone, check him out. Hey. Anyway, Hulk says that uh, time travel is not his area of expertise, but you know, he gives it a try anyway. And, and on, I, I, I agree with him, it worked. Kind of. I mean, at the, at the very least, they can, you know, de-age somebody. So, say, if they have an old character, someone who's an old man, and they, uh, you know, wanted to bring him back for a future movie, um... Um, I'm just saying. Because Captain America is really old now. Speaking of Hulk's experiments, given that they later establish how little the amount of Pym particles they have remaining is, how much exactly did they waste during that experiment? Especially when you think that, you know, much like any experiment, it goes through several test runs before you actually, you know, do the thing. So there was more to that off screen that we didn't get to see. 
so uh, did they just have like a warehouse full and by the end they've only got one for every person to make the trip there and back so so tony of course you know achieves in an evening what science has been uh, unable to achieve in decades and he decides he's gonna help and this is actually where my my biggest problem comes into play i i've i've established this well in the past so i'm not gonna go too deep into it or nothing but they argue four or five times throughout this movie that you cannot change the past to alter the present because your present becomes your future and blah 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 particularly once they actually go back in time and banner's talking to the ancient one the ancient one flat out tells him you cannot create new timelines and yet everything that they achieve in this movie creates new alternate timelines my head hurts the russos even came out and said that they created new timelines so anyone who thinks that i'm wrong on that fact the russos even came out and flat out said it everything that they did new timeline the thing that the ancient one said you can't do they, they said you can't do it four or five times and then immediately did it Ah. And and yes, I have such a bad problem with the fact that they did that. But my biggest problem with the fact that they did that is if they had not spent so much time explaining the time travel nonsense. I mean, they, they literally have the same conversation about how you can't do this and here's how it's going to work at least three times that I can think of off the top of my head, if not four. If they had not spent all that screen time having the same conversation over and over again basically they could have fixed so many other problems with that time and they chose not to and that's the that's ah that's the biggest thing that just ah, ah. so then hulk and rocket they go to new asgard to get thor it's over in norway and all the remaining asgardians have come to live here as a new asgard the last time we saw the asgardians was at the beginning of Infinity War. Thanos was already on the ship and everybody on board was already dead. And even at the end of that scene, even if there was anybody else that was still alive, Thanos blew up the ship, so bye-bye everybody. And yet then Thor says that half of his people were wiped out. And obviously, you know, you got Valkyrie and Korg and Meek. They weren't on the ship. So where were the other half of the Asgardians this whole time? And when the snap happened, did half of that half also still get wiped out so is there like a fourth left how many asgardians are there that's what i'm getting at so everybody's back together they figure out where all the stones are and everything they make their big plan and everybody goes their separate ways why would rocket go with thor i mean i know that they know each other already from infinity war and stuff but it kind of doesn't make sense to send rocket with anybody because now that means he literally has to tell hawkeye and black widow here's how you fly a spaceship uh here's how you get to Vormir and yes I know he says he programmed in the thing so all they have to do is just not crash but well crashing is a very distinct possibility when you have no idea how to fly a spaceship just saying maybe he could have flown it himself because all he had to do on Asgard was tell somebody stick this thing into Natalie Portman and that sounded way worse than it was meant to so moving on now according to the Russo brothers Iron Man actually was originally going to go with Thor to Asgard and he even had has like this stealth suit that makes him pretty much like invisible so he's sneaking around the palace but of course Heimdall sees all so he can still see him and there's like a big Iron Man Heimdall fight again with the missed opportunities. Meanwhile, over on Vormir, you got Hawkeye and Black Widow, and they debate over who gets to kill themselves to get the Soul Stone. Of course, this all finishes out with Natasha going over and she dies, and Hawkeye gets the Soul Stone. But why does he get the Soul Stone? He didn't sacrifice her, she jumped. She sacrificed herself yes he lost her yes he tried to save her but he didn't let her die or sacrifice her in any way so he 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 really shouldn't have got the stone i'm just saying and how funny would that have been if if she jumps and falls over and red skull's just like sorry I, I, I told you you had to sacrifice that which you love you didn't sacrifice her she jumped so uh 
Got anything else? You got everybody going to New York. And of course, Banner goes over. He meets the Ancient One, like we already talked about. And the Ancient One says that removing the stone from this existence, while it would save his, would doom theirs by creating a new branch existence. And Banner even goes as far as to say, not if we return the stones at the end and put them back the same, you know, moment that they were taken. That would erase the branch, except that it doesn't. I I mean, I mean, you already created the branch. You can't now erase this new existing branch without undoing everything you've already done. So by erasing or by trying to erase the other branch, you essentially are just creating a third branch. And of course the ancient one, she doesn't want to send the stone off with him. She says that Dr. Strange, why, you know, why would he give the stone over? He's supposed to be the best of us. And he says, you know, he handed it over willingly. Maybe he made a mistake. And she says, or I did. Is that supposed to be the setup for the multiverse of madness because it sounds like it like in that reality where they got the stones from she chooses to not train dr strange and then like dormammu shows up and stuff gets nasty so they got i don't know i'm thinking too far ahead not even talking about the right movie so i'm gonna shut up so captain america and iron man and ant-man they go to avengers tower and they screw everything up and loki gets away which where did loki go i know i know we're gonna find Find out in the Loki TV show on Disney Plus, so make sure to subscribe. Seriously, be, be sure to subscribe here too, because I mean it's just it's one button. You can't, I mean, what do you got to lose for it? So with the Space Stone now gone, Cap and Tony actually have to travel further back in time to New Jersey in 1970 to not only get another shot at the Space Stone, but hey, we can pick up some more pin particles while we're there. Convenience. Quick side note: Did anybody else notice that Stan Lee looked a hell of a lot like Mark Maron in this scene? While they're back in 1970, Cap runs into good old Peggy Carter. Now, Captain America went into the ice during World War II, which ended in 1945. In the MCU, Peggy Carter was born April 9th, 1921, which would make her 24, roughly, around the time that Cap went into the ice. And in 1970, the scene that we're currently in, she would be 49 years old. Now, I've seen some people that look pretty great when they're almost 50, but she looks exactly the same way she did when we saw her 25 years ago. Even less than 25 years ago if you watched the Peggy Carter TV show. So, yes, some people look great for 49, 50 years old, but to not age a day in 25 years? Wow. Also, side note, she actually mentions Captain Britain by name in this scene, if you listen closely. Meanwhile, Nebula and War Machine have traveled over to Morag in the year 2014. This is the point in the movie where we learn that there is a new threat in the form of the 2014 Thanos, Nebula, Gamora, all those guys. They're all still alive from the past, so reintroducing a bunch of dead characters to become new threats because it's a different version of them, more violent, and because it's a parallel universe and he's still a warrior and he's different somehow basically the russos have said that he's a younger version he's still very much in his uh, warrior phase so he's kind of like thanos at the peak of violence mode we get a bit of fan service in the form of seeing nebula and gamora fighting a bunch of soldiers the russos have stated that those soldiers that they are fighting are actually corbinites the same race that beta ray bill is from meanwhile back in the present nebula reaches in she grabs the power stone they're about to leave. War Machine pops out, but then Nebula's eye thing kind of starts twitching and she's in like a lot of pain. But then 2004, we're just going to call her Bad Nebula, starts uh, noticing that she can see what's happening there. So of course they play back all of her memories and stuff. And so they figure out the big plan. My question is, why did good Nebula as soon as she started like freaking out why didn't she just be like oh crap get me out of here and pop out like the second she realized that something was wrong because she she knew that thanos knew so why did she not just get out of dodge before they had a chance to do anything about her being there the answer to this question is so the movie can happen so good nebula gets captured and bad nebula goes back to the present in her place and we'll come back to that one. So everybody gets back to the present. They all got their stones. They forged their new infinity gauntlet made out of Stark tech. Hulk puts it on and it just immediately just just mangles his arm it like shrivels up and turns black and it's like horribly painful and just really does a number why 
I asked that earlier, and I, st I still want an answer. Why does the Infinity Gauntlet hurt you to wear it? I mean, it could be argued that Thanos had to go to Nidavellir to have a special gauntlet made that could, you know, withstand the power of the stones. That is that is said in there. You know, Eitri says that, that that's what he went there for. I mean, this is a guy that makes weapons for the gods. And here's Hulk putting it on, basically wearing Iron Man armor. So it could be argued that had he had the gauntlet or maybe if they had gone back to Nidavellir and made another gauntlet since it's already been established back here in Infinity War that the mold is still there maybe it wouldn't have done so much damage so why didn't they do that since they already knew that that was a thing that was there and was an option also according to the Russos since the damage was done by the stones it can't be reversed because reasons. So Hulk snaps, he brings all the snapped people back, and he says that he tried to bring Black Widow back, but he couldn't. Still don't understand that one. Basically, the Russos just said that she was the sacrifice for the Soul Stone, and there's no coming back from that. And we'll come back to that one as well. Then comes the biggest just WTF moment in the entire movie, and this was one of the, the biggest things that the Russos have actually come out on a few occasions to explain. There's a tiny little spider. I don't know if you can see him. He's right there. Itty bitty little guy, just off screen. So while they're doing the whole snap thing, uh, you know, Bad Nebula, she kind of wanders off, starts fidgeting with all the controls and stuff on the uh, time travel pad dealy thing, and she ends up bringing Thanos, Thanos' ship, and all of his minions through the portal to the present where they start bombing Avengers Tower. Um... How? I mean, it's been very well established that you've got to have that, you know, the, 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 the suit. You got to have the little GPS, quantum, quantum GPS thing. You got to have the quantum realm pad thing that you stand on. And, uh, well, most importantly, you got to have pin particles. To my knowledge, Thanos uh, doesn't have a surplus of pin particles uh, or the suit, the GPS, or any of that. Now, you could argue that they didn't need the suit because, well, they're, they're just awesome like that. They didn't need the platform or the GPS because Nebula was bringing them specifically to that point. She was retrieving them. They weren't traveling back. But they still don't got no PIM particles. So how do you explain that one? Well, according to the Russos... You see uh, Thanos' little right-hand guy, Ebony Maw. Well, he's this brilliant scientist. And he actually took the pin particles from Good Nebula. And he broke it down and made more. Lots and lots more. No, I, I might even be okay with this if they just showed up when they did. But they still had to send Bad Nebula back to the present. So that required pin particles as well. So when did he make these pin particles? Because if they sent her back, you got nothing to work with. But if you built it then, why didn't they just come and attack then before they could snap everybody back into existence? See, what I actually think is that the Russos really didn't think about that ahead of time. And they just pulled that answer uh, out. You know, they, they just pulled it, pulled it. There it is. Thunder. And that's another example of, of, you know, the whole ignoring the show, don't tell thing. Because for Ebony Maw to be this brilliant scientist, okay, sure, in the comic books he is. But in the movies, the only thing we've ever seen that would even slightly suggest that he's a brilliant scientist was back during Infinity War. He had those little icicle looking things pointed at Doctor Strange. And he said that they were surgical needles of his design. That's it. We go from that to I can break down and recreate pimp particles just by looking at it. Anyway, so Thanos bombs the crap out of Avengers headquarters. Nobody dies or really even gets injured for that matter because reasons. And of course the fight breaks out with Thanos versus Thor, Iron Man, and Captain America. And the three of them just get their butts handed to them by Thanos repeatedly. At one point during the fight, Thanos actually grabs Stormbreaker and like hits Thor with it. Pushing it into Thor's chest, trying to stab him like he did at the end of Infinity War. And everybody wants to know well, how can Thanos pick up Stormbreaker? He can't pick up Stormbreaker. He's not worthy. So do you remember back in the movie Thor, the first, you know, Thor movie, uh, you see Odin 
he took Mjolnir and he cast an incantation on it. Uh, whoever holds this hammer must be worthy of the power of Thor. You see, that is why Thor can pick up Mjolnir and nobody else can. Mjolnir isn't Stormbreaker. They're two totally different things. At least that's my assumption on that one. No one's actually come out and said it, but uh, I mean, that's why nobody else can pick up the hammer, but they didn't do that to the ax. So it just makes sense. Then the moment that, uh, that made hundreds of people wet themselves after 22 movies, Cap finally picks up Mjolnir and it's, it's glorious, it's triumphant and, and it's, 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 uh, well, we all knew it was coming. This actually brought up a rather general question from just about everybody and a specific question from me. Generally, everybody was asking, well, you know, he kind of moved it at least a little bit all the way back in Age of Ultron. Why was he not worthy then, but he is now? And this is where things get funny because the Russos actually came out and they said that, well, Kep was always worthy and he could have picked it up back in Age of Ultron, but he didn't want to embarrass Thor, so he didn't pick it up. He pretended like he couldn't do it. The writers of the movie, on the other hand, uh, disagree with that entirely. <laughs> they said that, I mean, I don't know if they said why he wasn't worthy then, but it is now, but they said that he was not worthy then, so they have no idea what the Russos are talking about, which is just fantastic. I, on the other hand, had a different question. My question is, once he does pick up Mjolnir, he starts doing lightning attacks and, and you know, all this stuff. Well, in Thor Ragnarok, it was established that Thor has the power of lightning and Mjolnir was just a tool to focus that power. Captain America, last I checked, doesn't have lightning powers. So, how is he doing that? Regardless, it finally comes down to where it's just Cap versus Thanos one-on-one, -on -one, and Thanos just smashes the crap out of Captain America's shield. And we'll come back to that. Finally, just at the perfect, beautiful moment, everyone who was snapped away comes walking through, uh, you know, the big Doctor Strange portal thingies, and, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, it's a great scene and everything, but just a little question. First of all, uh, how does Sam know that he's going to be coming in on the left of Captain America? I can just see him, like, having a conversation with, you know, Wong or whoever went there to bring them, you know, to the fight, where he's just like, hey, uh, can you figure out where Cap is standing and just make sure that I come in on his left side. Can you do that for me? It's good. It's going to be great. I pr promise me. Hey, Cap, on your left. That's just a scene that I genuinely, genuinely hope and believe happened off screen. And uh, it's, it's the little moments like that that make life worth living. Anyway, everybody comes walking through those portals. So everybody's here now, except for Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne and uh, Daredevil and Luke Cage, uh, Jessica Jones and the, the Punisher. I mean, Howard the Duck is even there for God's sake. You couldn't give those guys just like a cameo or something? And thus begins the biggest game of keep away the world has ever seen. Oh, I want so bad to get into, you know, that, that one scene, <laughs> that one shot, that one scene that bothers me so bad. But I won't. I will not. I will refrain. I will simply leave it as uh, the Russos did say that that was meant to be an A-Force uh, Easter egg type of thing. So in case anybody else was curious as to why that scene that doesn't make sense for any movie ever, especially this one, that's why it was there. So not so much a question as uh, more just kind of a blaring mistake at this point. But, uh, you know, at one point during the fight, you have Ant-Man and Wasp. They go off to fix the quantum tunnel inside the van. And of course, the van is all broken and everything. So they got to fix it. So they're fixing it. And uh, then we cut away. And at the same time that they're supposed to be in there fixing it, we see giant man pushing a Leviathan through a uh, wizard portal thing. And Wasp shows up for the little A-Force Easter egg thing. So continuity error just just you know fun it's fun it's uh, this movie is full of mistakes and i'm pointing them out basically kind of like the falcon scene i just kind of like to think that off screen they were like okay well i'm kind of bored with you know fixing this real quick so i'm just gonna hop out real quick uh, uh i don't know i'm gonna go grab that leviathan and shove it through a hole real quick so i'll be right back so uh just hang out for a second and she's like you know actually looks like all the girls are gathering up over there i'm gonna go join them for a second i'll be right you know i'll meet you back here in five little scenes that took place off screen in movies that, that would be a fun episode sometime just 
put your ideas down below. Finally, Thanos' troops are getting so beat up that Thanos says, you know, turn the uh, the guns on everybody, just start firing, and Ebony Maw is like, well, he's gonna kill our own troops, and Thanos, do it! It's all because he's about to die by Scarlet Witch, which, that was awesome, by the way. But, uh, all of a sudden, the guns stop firing, and they point up to the sky, and everybody's like, what's that? Something's coming! So finally, Captain Deus Ex Machina shows up to uh, have her little 15 seconds of screen time. Why bother? The Russos basically said that they either wanted to bring in Captain Marvel like way back with Age of Ultron which uh, recently there actually was some uh, some footage or some pictures or something that uh, that actually showed the stand-in for Captain Marvel standing there in that last scene where they're seeing all the new Avengers there she she was there in one version of that scene or just keep her out of it completely and introduce her you know after this whole phase was over with however the Disney executives were really pushing no we want Captain Marvel in there we want Captain Marvel we gotta have a really strong, powerful female in there. We want her force diversity thing. You know, that whole shenanigans, whatever. So they basically came to a compromise and said, tell you what, we'll keep her out of Infinity War because the original plan was, well, let's just have her show up for Infinity War. Uh, no explanation. She's just there. And the Russos were like, uh, no, let's not do that. So hold off on Infinity War. Then we can give her her own movie so people know, you know, who the hell she is. But then we'll bring her in for Endgame. I mean, at least it gives Thanos somebody, you know, on par power-wise to fight with. So that's why they, they shoehorned her in completely so somebody could take care of the ship while everybody else was on the ground fighting. And that Thanos could have somebody to spar with for a few seconds of screen time. So then we see Tony and he looks over at Doctor Strange. He's like, so you looked at 16 million futures. You know, is this that one? And Doctor Strange is like, well, if I tell you, then it won't happen. But then here we are a few minutes later and Tony is fighting Thanos one-on-one. -on -one. He gets knocked down. He looks over and Doctor Strange is... And they said that he's all shaky. He's all shaky and weird for a second there for some reason. And that was apparently something that we all missed because we're stupid. Or because the movie didn't tell us. But apparently, according to the filmmakers, uh, that one, the reason why he was so upset in that one was because Iron Man wasn't supposed to get knocked down there. Everything was going according to plan up until that moment, but then they missed the one. So he gave him the one, and Iron Man knew, oh crap, I gotta make this happen somehow, and then he goes back and he fought him. But yeah, that was actually a moment of like just sheer terror and desperation on Doctor Strange's part, and the movie forgot to tell us. So Thanos thinks he wins, and he says, I am inevitable. Dink! Nothing happens. Of course, we cut over to Iron Man. He's got all the stones. He says, and I am Iron Man. He snaps and everybody turns to dust. But why, out of everything that he could say, did he say, I am Iron Man? I mean, I know that the actual story behind that was originally he wasn't going to say anything at all. He was just going to snap. And the it was the editors that were going through saying, this just doesn't feel right. He needs to say something. Tony is a, he's a smarmy, you know, smart ass, basically. He needs to say something thing iconic here. But what? What could it be? So everybody's sitting around in a room and they're throwing out ideas and none of the ideas sound any good. And then finally someone says, how about I am Iron Man? And they're like, oh my god, that's it. So they literally brought RDJ back at the last possible minute to shoot just that scene of him saying, and I am Iron Man, and snapping his fingers. That was the thing he said one time at the end of the very first movie, so I get that it brings it back full circle, but it made no sense to say. I mean, it picked sure literally anybody else in that scenario. Say it's, you know, Doctor Strange in that scenario. I am inevitable. And I am Doctor Strange. It's like if I was Thanos, even knowing that I was about to turn into dust, I would look at him and just say, really? That's your comeback? Oh, what happened? Oh, anyway, Tony dies and we get what is quite possibly my very favorite part of this whole movie. When Pepper is talking to him, she says, it's okay, you can rest now. And I don't know if it was intentional or not. Because saying, you know, it's okay, you can rest, that's something that people say to someone who's about to die. You know, it's okay, you can go, we're all right, you can rest now. 
I don't know if you can hear that, but it's raining really hard right now. But earlier in the movie, right after Tony has figured out that he knows how to do time travel, he goes to Pepper and he's like, I can help, but if you don't want me to, I'll put it all away right now. I'll forget all about it. And she says, but will you rest? And now here she is in the end telling him you can rest now. So I don't know if that was intended to be a callback or if it was totally coincidental, accidental, whatever, but it worked and it was beautiful and I loved it. Of course, what happens immediately after that was actually cut from the movie and it was my actual favorite part of what should have been the movie where everyone like drops to a knee the deleted scene is on Disney plus if you haven't seen it watch the deleted scene from that it's beautiful it's haunting it's like watching his death did nothing to me watching that made me ball like a little boy speaking of Tony's death we've seen back during Guardians of the Galaxy a single infinity stone completely level a building from the explosion of a, of a person a humanoid being trying to hold it we've seen Thanos use the stones and he could completely scarred almost killed him same thing with the Hulk so why was Tony able to use all of the infinity stones without exploding there is the not so great answer that well his armor cushion the blow but his armor was pretty ravaged by that point i mean it, it at least should have it like blackened one side of his face and that was it i mean it should there should have been nothing left why did tony get a funeral and black widow did not get a funeral i mean if nothing else they could have done them at the same time we definitely got plenty of scream time with everybody talking about being very upset over her death and yes i did just say scream time instead of screen time but screw it but yeah that's kind of lame i mean they they give him this nice big funeral that gets everybody who's ever been in a Marvel movie to show up in one big giant scene but yeah sorry Nat uh, you don't get one sorry and the the answer that the Russos gave to this one was just so ridiculous that it baffles the mind they basically were like well we see everyone is grieving about her death on screen so you know we don't exactly say how much time passes from the beginning of the movie until the end of the movie so they probably had her funeral you know off screen somewhere or it's possible that it could appear in a future movie i mean i guess we'll just have to wait for the black widow movie and see that's even worse man to just say we intentionally left it out i mean now maybe maybe that was their way of saying well it's gonna be in the black widow movie and they just didn't want to spoil it but if not that's like just that's just harsh anyway moving on captain america goes back in time to put all the stones back in place and you have to assume that at least one of those trips had to at least be a little awkward if nothing else i mean assuming that you know everything went off without incident he still had to go to vormir and return the soul stone to his greatest arch nemesis ever <laughs> what was that conversation like and this is another one of those things where there's been conflicting stories because originally the russo said that whenever cap went back to Vormir that Red Skull wasn't there but they've since come out and said no he was there and I I don't know what their interaction was but they they said that he was there so it, it, can, can we see that I would I would I would like to see that please Kevin Feige please can we see the scene please thank you maybe it's because if Captain America went there and Red Skull wasn't there that Captain America would then get stuck being the new keeper of the Soul Stone and well that would kind of suck so they had to change their mind and be like no 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 wait wait he was there he was he was still there just hanging out because he doesn't have a ship so how would he leave so yeah of course he was still there I guess and that of course giving it back does once again lock the red skull into being the soul stones keeper which is lame because he's in captain america's arch nemesis and there's plenty of other stories to be told there even if we don't have steve rogers captain america anymore but still unfortunately regarding the same scene they said that just because the soul stone was returned does not mean that natasha is brought back to life but of course just because the writers say one thing doesn't mean that the opposite is completely true i guess we will have to wait for the black widow movie if it ever comes out at this point i think it's november now or something like that and of course captain america stays in the past and we have learned a few things from the russo brothers regarding that did bucky know that cap was going to stay in the past yes how much he knew is unclear but he did know that he had fully well intended to go back and you know spend his days with Peggy. He also did know that Captain America was going to pass the shield on to the Falcon. Which brings me back to a 
point from earlier. Where did the new shield come from? Did he just steal it from his past self? So one of these branch alternate universes has a Captain America that's just like, dude, where did I put my shield? I have looked everywhere for it. Does Cap going back and be with Peggy mean that Peggy never married the man that Cap had saved and then have two kids with that man? According to the Russos in this particular universe, yes, Captain America is a dick. Was the story about Peggy Carter marrying a man that Captain America had saved just a cover for her actually being married to Captain America the whole time? Maybe is the answer we've been given to that question. Maybe. Thanks for, thanks for clearing that one up, guys. Was Captain America a pallbearer at Peggy Carter's funeral? So two Captain Americas in the same room together. Again, maybe. The end of an era, folks. You got Harley, the little kid from Iron Man 3, shows up at Iron Man's funeral. He's the only non-Avenger or government official who is at this funeral. Why? Why is he there? I mean, I get that he and Tony had a bond and they connected and all that good stuff, but like, he's not even focused on. We're not told who he is. And he's grown up like a lot since Iron Man 3. So if you didn't know that that was the same actor, then you were just in the, who, well, who's that guy? Why is he just kind of standing there with everybody else? And wait, I recognize everybody else here, but who's that dude? What's he doing there? I'm sure given that Cassie Lang has now grown up some and you even got, you know, Morgan Stark, which granted she's a little young perhaps, but we're introducing a lot of, a lot of teenage characters all of a sudden. And personally, I believe that it's all a big Young Avengers setup. So that's probably what that was all about but i don't know i'm just speculating i'm sure that there are a lot more questions but i feel like i'm rambling at this point and the one for friday is a lot better because i've covered this particular topic a couple of times now and i haven't covered friday yet so i'm really excited about that one so if there's anything that i have missed please put it in the comments below i mean once again guys this this movie was the absolute it, it definitely was the end of an era i mean they could have completely stopped the MCU at this point and it would have been a fitting ending to it. I mean, in a weird way, the fact that they didn't just end it there and knowing that there are more movies that are still coming down the pipe, it feels weird. It just feels wrong. Where does the MCU go from here? What do you think? Let me know. And make sure that you guys check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those wonderful things. Make sure you subscribe because getting back into it, getting uh, going to get those regular videos coming back out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So uh, join us, won't you? While you're at it, make sure you pop over to www.geekycool.com, your one-stop shop for all things nerd. Not only can you find uh, my videos over there, but you can also find articles, opinion pieces, top 10 lists. If it's about games or movies or comics or just, you know, nerd things that we like as nerds. If it's a nerd topic, you're going to find it there. There's even a weekly live vlog on Tuesday nights and you yourself can actually get in on that action. So go check it out. Now, what are you waiting on? www.geekycool.com and you be sure to tell them that Scallywag Production sent you. You tell them we said, hey, I don't know why I went Southern there, but uh, it happened. So it, it happened. That wraps it up, guys guys for Avengers Endgame. I hope you enjoyed it. My throat hurts from talking so much now, so I'm going to take a break before I start shooting Friday's episode. <laughs> Yay! Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you then.